I don't think, you know, I have a very weird opinion on this, Jay. I think that pe most people shouldn't be investing at all. And I, I'm not even sure the S&P 500 is safe. You know, we assume the S&P 500 is safe, but there's no a priori reason to believe that's true. We look at post hoc, ergo, propter hoc. We say that it's gone up before, therefore it will go up again. And that's not something that you should be able to hang your hat on logically, right? It's kind of silly um, to think that that's, conditions will persist because you believe that conditions have persisted, therefore they'll persist forever. It's like looking out and seeing the rain and saying it'll never stop raining because it's raining right now. You know, it's just something to sort of keep in mind. America could go, go uh, through a Japan period where we have 30 or 40 years on no, with no growth in our stock market. And this could be the day that it starts. You don't know. So I think, you know, there's a lot of issues there, you know, with that assumption. If you can spend your your all your days kind of investing in a space that that you understand really well, you know you you can certainly uh, try investing. But even then, people who can spend all their time investing, even of those people, only a few percent of them will end up being good investors. So it's a very 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 difficult uh, thing to do. And this isn't a theoretical. Un, unlikely exercise. I see somebody said it's like a meteor hitting the earth. No, not even close. In fact, of the last 30 years uh, that I've been watching the markets, many countries have gone bankrupt. Currencies have had to be restated. And huge market leaders, have, superpowers have become irrelevant. So don't just assume the S&P 500 will go up forever. I think that's crazy. You know, you can short stocks, you can short indices, you can hedge currencies globally, you know, the very wealthy people I know, they don't make big bets in the U.S. Um, certainly some of them do, but a lot of them have geographical diversification, country diversifications, and they don't all have beta. You know, you want, you don't want beta. You want some inflation protection, that's for sure, but you, you don't need stocks to get that. Um, I don't know. I think uh, shorting is not for everybody, that's for sure. I don't think the stock market and IQ, I don't think IQ will help you too much in the stock market. It might help a little bit, but you need a lot of self-awareness and emotional self-control in the stock market. Uh, I definitely think uh, a hard work ethic. Uh, stock market requires a lot of patience, which is emotional self-control, but also a lot of hard work. You really have to be willing and excited to pour over every stock, which a lot of people don't have that kind of reverse ADHD. So if you have ADHD, that's not good in the stock market because you're like a buzzing bee constantly buzzing to the next stock and the next stock and the next stock. <clears throat> but you never focus enough to complete that one stock often. So you want some shortcut, but you need both like curiosity and then also determination to see the, the project through. You have to be a little bit stubborn sometimes in the stock market. No nootropics, no Adderall, no. You're either naturally smart or you're not. You know, I, I don't think there's a way to artificially create intelligence. Yeah, there's just no such thing as nootropic either. If you look at some of the studies, there was a, a study of uh, chess players taking Adderall and Modafinil, and neither help them. You're either smart or you're not. If you're smart, you don't need nootropic. You know, you should be happy that you won a little bit of a genetic lottery there. If you're not so smart, you know, nothing's going to change it. You maybe can make up for that in charisma, poise, so many other factors. Intelligence is just one small one. Maybe 10% of success, not 100%. If intelligence was 100% of success, we would have a lot of very wealthy um, professors and things like that. There's no, there's no such thing as nootropic at all, in my opinion. It's very hard to intervene in the mental brain cognitive function process. People want to distill things, uh, distill complex processes into very simple abstractions, but they're, it's often impossible. It's very much impossible when you don't understand the complex process. Intelligence and concentration are, are somewhat correlated or whatever related, but I, I actually think they're not really related. Executive function is one way, to, I guess, to look at it, but probably the best way to look at it is, you know, can you solve a difficult logical problem? Concentrating on it will often be able, you know, will often help you be able to solve that problem, but a lot of times it's whether it's within your reasoning ability if you can't reason around the problem and it just befuddles you or you think you have the answer but completely wrong answer, that's the question. You know, concentration is important. Uh, 
for productivity, things like that. But I don't think it's a root of intelligence. I don't like unions because I think I think they're they're sort of what economists look at as kind of like a, a control, where anytime you kind of try to control a market, including a labor market, you end up with these negative consequences. And we know that unions are corrupt. You know, unions don't really achieve what they're going for. You know, in in a in an economy that relies less and less on labor, you know, I, I just don't know that, you know, we need a union. We need unions at all. Sizing, entry, exit, those are all tough questions. Uh, lifetime of experience. And quite frankly, I'm just not that very, very good at it. I mean, I try to have equal weight positions. That's kind of one mantra I have. I don't really try to say that, oh, I like this stock more than I like that stock. And I know a lot of other traders try to really size their positions really carefully. Now, again, what I try to do and what I actually do are often two different things. So I do have different size positions, but I think the ideal world is you actually kind of have equal, equal weighted positions. Very few people can actually tell ahead of time what their best stocks are going to be or not going to be. Um, and so you just introduce risk by pretending that you, you know that this should be a 5% position versus a 2% position that you're subjectively that you, you know, ahead of time and that you <laughs> want to adjust those positions every second and, you know, just be happy that if you have any alpha at all, you know, stop worrying so much about these little adjustments that'll probably distract you more than help you. I don't know if the market will go up, or up or down. I was just explaining that I don't think you should really care about that. You know, why, why would you care about that? What's the point? Are you going to work on Wall Street and try to work for somebody saying, oh, I know when the market can go, goes up and I know when the market goes down. That's not a career. You, you should focus on what can you market. If you become the, the expert in semiconductor stocks, someone will want to hire you. And maybe you can make money, you know, in semiconductors. But you certainly are not going to convince anybody that you you know when the market's going to go up and down because you study inflation and you know more about inflation than anybody else. I mean, you, you, there's nothing wrong with pursuing a degree in, uh, in economics, but uh, I don't think that's what's going to get you there. Yeah, I mean, most people are just gambling when they come to when it comes to the macro. I'm highly leveraged, aka I'm gambling. Macro will affect all of the your industries equally, so you don't really have to follow the macro. If you worked at a hedge fund and you start talking about CPI, people would laugh at you. Unless you're a macro trader, you know, that has spent your whole life on macro trading, then you don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, well, the context is important. Wall Street analysts don't really care about automation. They're not trying to do that. They're not quant investors. Wall Street analysts aren't trying to automate their models because they need to make their models to understand them, not to automate them. It's just a misunderstanding of what the goal is. The goal isn't efficiency. The goal is understanding. If you're telling me I should automate something, but you don't know enough about Wall Street to realize that there's sort of two schools of Wall Street. There's fundamental analysts that don't automate, don't care to automate, don't want to automate. And there's quantitative analysts who spend a lot of time automating. You know, and there's, there's, they're just two separate branches. You know, the one never uses that kind of stuff. That's how Wall Street does it, Jonathan. It's been the same way for 40 years. I talk to top Wall Street analysts all day long at the biggest hedge funds. It's what they do. This is a notebook for a financial analyst that takes their notes in it. Can I, can I just do a MySQL query in here? Let's see. Equals MySQL. Uh, let's see. Select star from... Oh, wait. It's going all haywire. It's not working. Oh, I can't use MySQL. X select star from... Oh, it's breaking. What's wrong? Why isn't my, MySQL working? Okay, so the broker has to become an expert in financial markets, and then he's also going to make his own MySQL API. That's really smart. That's going to happen. Hey, let me spend all my time researching biotech companies, and then let me also learn how to, how to program. When is the person going to have job time for their, their day job? It's just stupidity. Stupidity is, is bothersome to anyone who has intelligence. Use your brain next time. I'd love to help you with your software, but you're going to have to learn how to program your own software. That's the point of a software company, isn't it? To provide a software product so that the end user doesn't have to make their own software product. Uh, quarterly numbers are not available in this style and format, and you can't make your own forecasts on those websites, Wei Wei Chan. So this is what basic job in finance is called an analyst job. So anybody on Wall Street 
who has seen this knows what I'm doing. If you're not from Wall Street, this might look confusing to you, but that is uh, what half of Wall Street just spends all their time doing is looking at financial analysis. And this is typically how you do it. All my friends at Citadel and Millennium and Point72 and all the top investment firms, even Warren Buffett does it. So nothing unusual here. I'm not showing you some of the due diligence uh, checking channels and things like that, but you know this is at least the first, what I would do if, at a hedge fund if it was my first look at a company for a few hours, but I'd like to talk to management. I'd like to you know, call some of their customers, interview. A lot of it's uh, people skills, you know, talking to people, um, talking to former employees. What, how'd you like working at Texas Instruments? What'd you think was really interesting? Don't tell me any insider information, but, you know, what's a new opportunity for Texas Instruments? So it's hard to memorize how many shares outstanding a company has. But if you're really lit, you really know investing, you know all the companies in your portfolio, you know how many shares outstanding they have. That's when you you know you're on top of things. I used to say that some people can tell you the batting average of every New York Yankees player. I can tell you the S&P 500 earnings estimates for every S&P 500 constituent. That's what I used to say to like mic drop interviews and stuff like that. I strongly encourage everyone to sort of ignore their own personal experiences with these stocks. I know there was this big meme when I was a kid. I actually remember uh, quite quite vividly reading uh, One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch in uh, around probably April or May of 2000. Um, I was living with my parents at the time and wanted to be a stock market genius. And I read about Peter, Peter Lynch's advice that, you know, you can go to the mall uh, your local mall and sort of see what stocks are doing the best by seeing who's selling the most product and stuff like that in, in your own mall. Now that's nonsense. You know, I, I really think there's, there's no, there's no benefit to doing that. You know, investing is a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, you know, it's, there's no doubt that, 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 you know, obviously there's some, you know, feedback you can get, but the, the stock market knows this kind of stuff. The stock market knows, if a company's business is doing well, maybe things were a little different in the Magellan days. Uh, and I don't want to take anything away from Peter Lynch, who did very well. But, um, you know, the, the, the world's changed quite a bit since then. And I, I really wouldn't endorse that approach. Investing is about buying something for the right price. That's something that I try to stress to everybody. You know, there are good companies, there are bad companies. But in a lot of ways, that's not that relevant to the investor. The investor buys at a good price. There's some great companies like Apple where there's just not a price that, you know, you would ever uh, want to use uh, that price as your purchase price. And there's some terrible companies that, you know, you'd, you'd want to buy at the right price. You know, I'm talking a lot like a value investor. Of course, in the long run, growth, growth tends to obscure the, the utility of price and price discipline. For example, if you really were convinced that Apple was a great company 10 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago, it would have been a great call no matter what price you paid. Um, but that requires like a really unbelievable ability to uh, see the future. And, and often that's stoch fairly stochastic. And you can do just fine without shorting, but you probably are making a beta bet that, you know, you may you may feel comfortable with, you know, Warren Buffett is funny. Warren Buffett is like, Oh, you got to bet on America. I mean, America's great. Okay. That's fine. Um, he's maybe more qualified than I am to make that call because I don't know, you know, I have no clue if America is going to keep outperforming, right? Like, I don't know how to even think about that question. I haven't done what Ray Dalio has done. If you want to read Ray Dalio's work on this stuff, what makes a country great? Right, what makes a country sustainable. And he did a lot of work on what happened in Japan, what happened in Germany, what happened in all these other countries, in China especially, and how these countries shifted. Now that That is the, the question that I, I really don't know the answer to. And I don't know if Warren Buffett is all cap, as the kids are saying these days, or he, he, he really knows what he's talking about, because that's a, I love Warren Buffett, my hero. But, you know, he's also not the world's expert on everything. I know that's a little sacrilegious for some people to say, but I'm the biggest Warren Buffett fan there is. 
and I don't think that he knows everything. Michael, good question. You know, I would look at recurring revenue. Went mid for some reason. You know, um, not and obviously in that business, recurring revenue kind of doesn't exist, right? So, I guess the way I would try to think about it is: Can you? Uh, is there dependable business? Does the franchise depend on a single banker or something like that? Um, of course, I'd, I'd sort of be analyzing whether or not you know they're they're sort of a franchise brand name that'll bring revenue without <coughs> any specific bank uh, banker. If there's a specific banker that is bringing in all the business, it's it's a, worth a lot less. If it's a diverse group yeah, and it's got a good brand name in a special sector or whatever, then that's you know that's obviously a good thing. So I would focus on EBITDA for sure, not not so much revenue. If it's not a profitable business, then I'd be pretty concerned unless you had a, a special way to make it profitable. And I would look at several years of revenue and EBITDA, preferably at least five years. S buying small businesses is usually tricky unless you know there's some really good margins. And most of the time, investment banking doesn't have good margins because it's very much a function of the bankers and they command quite a bit of the business and they can take their business elsewhere obviously but if there's dependable dependable margins dependable business three million of revenue can you get 300k to 600k EBITDA possibly is that you know what I pay three times EBITDA two or three times EBITDA for that yeah remember there's no growth in this business either and you're it's like it's a bit cyclical too so keep all that in mind there's some cyclicality in banking um, depends on the kind of banking. Is it M and A? Is it placements? You know, there's a bunch of stuff like that. So, lots of uh, questions there, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. But I, I think um, I would I wouldn't buy it unless there's clear profitability and there was no risk that your purchase would result in a banker leaving or some of the economics changing or something like that. Which with a lot of these acquisitions will often happen. Ninety percent margins. That's crazy. 90% yeah, margins good. sounds like, too good to be true. You'd have to find a way to incentivize the bankers to stay. Uh, some kind of contractual deal or you, you cut them into the business a little bit more. If they're the major shareholders right now, then I, I'd be very careful about buying the business because those relationships may disappear. But, you know, if you want some more advice, you could just uh, message me. Sounds like an interesting situation. be happy to advise you. Steve Cohen or Stan Druckenmiller? Oh man, I don't know. You're talking about two very rich guys that have been very good at the stock market. You know, I'd say Steve Cohen's probably had more of an impact on Wall Street. Druckenmiller certainly is an incredible investor, but uh, you know, Steve Cohen sort of had a kind of a bit bigger business environment. Duquesne and uh, Point State. I guess Point State wasn't really Stan anyway. But uh, point is. Uh, you know, Cohen's sort of empire on Wall Street is sort of is always sort of bigger than Druckenmiller's, if that makes sense. So his footprint was kind of bigger. Not that that's the be all end all. Steve Cohen uh, was uh, generally kind of vaguely accused of insider trading by a lot of people. It never really stuck in any particular way. You also have to think about the era that Steve grew up in on Wall Street was rife with insider trading. Information arbitrage, quote unquote, was very, very popular. It's a lot less popular now. But back in the day, you know, it was all about what information you had. And that's changed a lot. You know, people are no longer scrambling for secret information, primarily because it's kind of illegal to do so, but also because it, it doesn't seem to work that great. You know, companies' results can change quickly. And if you want to build a scalable enterprise, you can't try to be on top of every single stock and every single market and you're in and out as soon as the conditions of that company's earnings change. That's not really a great way to invest. You know, Warren Buffett doesn't invest that way, for example. You know, it's kind of a silly thing. You're looking for companies that have, you know, the ability to, to grow and things like that. I mean, you make tons of money when you can do that. You can buy one stock that can really become a, a world leader. That's what Buffett did. Again, I'm not saying Cohen's strategy, you know, speaks for itself. His results are incredible, you know, but his results are kind of like funding lots of traders in essence to manage, you know, smaller amounts of money and, um, you know, hope that they can outperform the market.
And, you know, that's worked really great. It's a, it's a brilliant move that he was sort of a, somewhat of a pioneer on. You know, uh, the whole pet pod shop is kind of the way some people say it, but giving a portfolio to different analysts. Like, for example, in this chat, I would give Ergo44 $200 million to trade biotech, and I would give Like Smasher $500 million to trade tech. Um, and I would give Matt a billion dollars to trade consumer and, and whoever did the best, I would give them more money and whoever did the least, I would, uh, did the poorest, I would say I would take, take money out of their accounts and fire them. So that's kind of the way Steve Cohen works. And then I give sheep a big homie sheep a, I give him 10% no matter what he gets a taste off the rip. That's Orion. Is accounting a good good degree to have? Yeah, I think accounting is a really good degree to have, to be honest. Um, it's a very nice paying, stable job. You learn a lot about business. You get to sort of have a uh, passenger side. What do they call the second, the front seat in the car? Passenger side, uh, passenger seat. You're not in the driver's seat, but you're in the passenger seat of a lot of exciting things. So. How much do I make monthly right now? What a weird question. <laughs> you just send me your email. I'll send you my bank account information. Yeah, most entrepreneurs don't make too much money until they sell their company. I've never had a like substantial salary in my whole life. I didn't make any money, uh, any salary running touring. Uh, VC, breaking into hedge funds. Hedge funds are weird. I mean, just make, you know, make sure you focus on your network, I guess. That's kind of what I would say. Hedge funds are, you know, it's definitely an insular business and you've got to crack into those people. Now, that has nothing to do with succeeding as a hedge fund analyst. You know, it's a whole other story. That's very, very, very hard to do. It's doable. It's not a great, it's a very tough, very tough job. It's a, being a star analyst in hedge funds is woof, very hard to pull off. You're only as good as your last pick. Any one pick can get you fired. It's a very tough industry. I do think PE is more chill. There's just as much money, if not more money. Although I could see the PE guys, like the bosses, being very stingy on the bonuses. You know, in hedge funds, you, you can actually make a lot of money as an analyst or as a PM. And PE, I could see the... I could definitely see the, the bosses stiffing you. It's like, team effort. Team effort. I told you to buy that stock. The stock went up. I want my 20%. At least give me 10%. Give me a pat on the back. Here's your $200,000 bonus, son. One day you might be promoted to managing director, junior partner. Man, I want 10% off the top. Y'all made 100 mil? Write me that check for 10 mil. That's it. I ain't trying to be greedy. I should get all 20 mil. Incentive fee for real, for real. I'll split the incentive fee with you 50-50. That means 10 for me. Jake, med school's uh, important to stick through. I mean, I had I have a lot of friends in hedge funds who got their MD and they went straight into hedge funds. So there's no reason why you have to finish med school without and then become a doctor. You don't necessarily have to do that. Medical degree is very valuable regardless. Well, one of my friends is, uh, I don't know if he's a billionaire, but if he's not a billionaire, he's pretty close. Um, he got a medical degree, then went to, uh, went to wall street and did really well. Uh, obviously he, his story is unique. He never practiced medicine. He just went straight to wall street and then he became a hedge fund manager. Not everybody can do that. Obviously, you know, he was a one, he's a one of a kind guy in general.